Discovering Alabama is a production of the Alabama Museum of Natural History. A land of contrasts. Color against color. Fields of flowers. Fields of green. Lush natural forests. Planted pines. Pastoral pasture lands. Wooded wonderland. Mighty rivers, tamed waters, little critters, big critters. Hi, I'm Doug Phillips. Today we're going to explore a land of enchanting contrast, a land known worldwide as the Alabama Black Belt. Here we'll find a natural world flourishing in fertile soil and we'll find a human world that figuratively and literally has its roots in that same soil. Join me for a journey across Alabama's Blackland Prairie. We'll explore what makes this area unique in all the world. We'll examine the natural history and how it gave rise to the human history. We'll consider contemporary concerns and we'll look with hope to the future. We may even discover why here we are talking about the Black Belt surrounded by a white landscape. This program is about a land unknown to many people, a land that in many ways has maintained its native natural wonders, a place of bountiful backcountry, forests, streams, and wildlife more diverse than can be found in much of the inhabited world. Come along with me as we explore the wild wonders of this land. Come along as we discover Alabama. Welcome to Discovering Alabama, and welcome to Alabama's Blackland Prairie, a land of contrasts. The Blackland Prairie takes its name from its dark, rich soils and the fact that broad parts of this region have distinctively prairie land qualities. More commonly known as the Black Belt, this belt of fruitful ground stretches across Alabama's coastal plain. From east to west, the band runs roughly from just below Auburn, through Montgomery, through Selma, broadening as it goes on into eastern Mississippi. So what are we doing here in this snowy white terrain? This ancient layer of sediments is called the Selma Chalk. An underlying reason why the Black Belt soils are so dark and rich. The Selma chalk also underlies one of nature's great metaphors. During the last age of the dinosaurs, this region of Alabama was covered by shallow seas. As the oceans receded, they left behind the fossilized remains of billions upon billions of microscopic marine creatures. These creatures make up what we know today as the Selma chalk which is exposed and easily visible in many places along stream banks, hilly eroded areas, and other such sites. In flatter areas though, these tightly packed sediments are impervious to water and therefore catch and hold plenty of moisture. This combines with collected organic matter to form rich soil. The chalk itself is infertile, yet it provides a base for the highly fertile soils from which the Blackland Prairie draws its name. Without these soils, the Selma chalk would be practically worthless. And without the chalk, the soils would not be so productive. Black and white, together they form a rich landscape long considered among the world's most fruitful. Yet rich and fruitful are hardly terms we associate with Alabama's Black Belt today. The Black Belt has been a kind of statistical anchor on the state of Alabama. And the people there have struggled. The people there have not had the same kinds of opportunities that are abundant in the rest of this state. I sometimes tell audiences that if you could remove the Black Belt from Alabama from in a statistical sense, if you didn't count the 14 Black Belt counties, we'd move up to number seven in the nation in terms of productivity, number 11 in the nation in terms of creation of new jobs, 12 in the nation in terms of health care but the Black Belt's not going anywhere, and the people in the Black Belt aren't going anywhere. 
How is it possible that this fertile crescent can host what are today many of the poorest counties in the United States? To understand this contrast, we must come to understand the land itself. And for that, we must look back across history, across prehistory and before. Of all the states east of the Mississippi River, we probably have the longest fossil record of any state and the most diverse fossil record. Uh, within that, if you look at the Black Belt area, it shows a record of the Cretaceous period. And during that time period, we have all the marine sediments, also some other terrestrial and nearshore marine sediments laid down during the Cretaceous, which is a time period we're very interested in now because there were a lot of different animals existing at that time period that went extinct by the end of the period. And of course, that leaves us the question of why. And hopefully looking at that, uh, at the fossils from the Black Belt will help, help us answer that question. It would be difficult to know exactly how many millennia passed before the first humans arrived in this area. However, we can surmise that when the Aboriginal peoples did arrive, they followed the rivers. Archaeology tells us where the Indians were. Uh, there are plentiful archaeological remains along the main river valleys where there's permanent water. But in the drier interior of the Black Belt, uh, the archaeological remains is very thin, suggesting there's not a permanent uh, habitation there. When the first explorers of recorded history entered the area, they too followed the rivers. Later, when the French and the Spanish arrive, uh, they do the same thing. They settle along the main river valleys, the Alabama, the Cahaba, the Tom Bigby, uh, but it's much later until uh, there's any real population in the interior of the Black Belt. The fact that the rivers played such an important role in bringing people into the area is of no small significance, because if the rivers could bring people in, they could take products out. Alabama became the 22nd state in December of 1819. And by that time, a flow of settlers was already flooding into the area. Settlers flocked into this state from the Carolinas, from Georgia, even some from Tennessee. They came to Alabama, or this new state of Alabama, really with one thing in mind, to grow cotton. You could grow cotton for year after year after year on these soils without a loss in yields. In addition to their desire to grow cotton, these settlers brought with them a system of agriculture, the plantation system. In North America, the plantation system originated in tobacco-growing colonies like Maryland and Virginia. Early on, the system relied on the labor of family members and indentured servants. As worldwide demand for American products grew, so did the plantations, and so did the demand for cheap labor. By the time the plantation system found its way into the Deep South and Alabama, that labor was provided by slaves. Cotton was grown throughout the state, but it was here in the Blackland Prairie that King Cotton and the plantation system truly reigned. Again, it was the region's natural history that gave rise to this human history. One way of understanding the Black Belt is basically a soil type and the way that soil looks. Cotton tended to go toward that kind of loamy soil that produced wonderful cotton crops. And so that's where the major plantations were. And that's where you find the slaves. Something like 75% of the slaves were located in the Black Belt. Throughout the 1800s, the Blackland Prairie plantation owners grew rich and politically powerful. In 1847, the state capital was moved from Tuscaloosa to Montgomery in the heart of the Black Belt. Increasingly, the region began to exercise influence over every aspect of Alabama culture. There was, in fact, no sanctuary from the influence wealthy plantation owners could wield. For instance, there was no institution in Alabama that was more fiercely political in the run-up to the Civil War than Methodist, Baptist, and Presbyterian churches. And whereas the state of Alabama did not secede until 1860, the churches actually seceded in the 1840s. So the Methodist Church actually split in the South in 1844. 
The next year, in 1845, the Baptists split. They had a convention at uh, Augusta, and they formed the Southern Baptist Convention. Later, Presbyterians split. So by the Civil War, uh, with the exception of the Episcopal Church, virtually every major denomination that was important in the South had already seceded 20 years before the state got around to seceding. By the 1860s, cotton barons were using all the wealth, political power, and cultural influence they could muster to cling to what they saw as their right to farm the land via the plantation system. And on January 11, 1861, by a vote of 61 to 39, Alabama seceded from the United States. Within a month, Montgomery, in the heart of the Black Belt, became the first capital of the Confederacy. It was here that the first Confederate Congress met. It was here that Jefferson Davis was inaugurated as president of the Confederate States of America. The Black Belt escaped the ravages of battle for most of the Civil War. And when war did reach the Blackland Prairie in the spring of 1865, it signaled the end. The end of the Confederacy, the end of slavery, the end of the plantation system. After the Civil War, the Black Belt, which had been the richest and most productive and most populous part of Alabama, begins to slowly die. And the center of Alabama really shifts to the Birmingham area and the new industrial world, the so-called New South. And so spatially, you have a separation of two worlds, but there's still an awful lot of tension between those two worlds, basically over politics. The Black Belt didn't want to give up its political power. The Black Belt managed to cling to political power in Montgomery until 1960, a hundred years after the Civil War. The loss of economic power, however, was much more immediate. The black population expected they were now going to replace the white owners of land, and in some places that occurred. Land, land was actually broken up uh, by the Freedmen's Bureau and distributed to some black landowners and especially in the western black belt. But for the most part, the war had brought the economy of the state uh, to, uh, into a collapse. And so one of the problems facing black and white Alabamians at the end of the war was, how are we going to sustain life? From the ashes of the plantation system arose another system as landowners attempted to cling to the soil as the source of wealth behind their political power. What we had emerging out of those post-war years was a, a share crop system which still tied much of the black population to the same land that they had farmed when they were slaves. The sharecropping system was very devastating on the land. There were absentee landowners and tenant farmers that grew the crops, and they basically turned the crops over to the landowners, uh, and so they exploited the land. There was no efforts at conservation as we know it today. The Black Belt was eroding away. That beautiful black soil that drew them here on these rolling hills of the Black Belt washed away fairly rapidly and underneath there you only had a few inches of that rich black soil before you encountered Selma chalk in many areas. The erosion of the landscape became an analog for the erosion of wealth and political power here in the Black Belt. Throughout the 20th century opportunities became more and more limited. What little work there was could be more efficiently done by a machine. Even a new plantation system began to reveal itself. All through this period, the government was encouraging planting idle acres to pine trees, and then in the mid-1980s, the Conservation Reserve Program came aboard, which in, in a matter of a year or two resulted in over 30% of the open land in the Black Belt being planted to pine trees. and that 
trend has continued for the past 15 to 20 years. So now we see a lot of the old cotton fields and a lot of the old pastures and dairy pastures and beef cattle pastures are now planted in pine trees. It doesn't take a lot of labor to harvest and grow pine trees. Once the system of agriculture was so labor intensive here in the Black Belt that almost half a million slaves worked these fields. Now, modern agricultural practices and techniques minimize the need for the labor of even those who might wish to work the fields. When I was growing up, Many of the people in the Black Belt were farmers. Since that period of time, many of the farmers have lost their farms. There are fewer families who are farming, and there hasn't really been anything to replace that. Well, it has been goodbye for a long time to the small farmers. They are, go they are gone. And I guess from now on, unless you are a large land owner, or you can forget farming in this area. Pine plantations, catfish farms, hunting camps, vast land holdings are often in the hands of owners that are from outside the region, whose families are not from the Black Belt. Many of the folks who actually live in the Black Belt often reap little benefit. We have a lot of absentee landowners, uh, very rich folk, uh, some corporations, and a lot of them, as I said, are absentee uh, landlords uh, that uh, have timber, fishing camps, uh, maybe uh, catfish ponds, and et cetera. A land of contrasts. Contrast between beauty and deterioration, between open fields and closed opportunities, between possibilities and realities. Among the greatest contrast is that between those who claim much of the wealth and those who claim very little. Ironically, this contrast is linked to an aspect of the Black Belt that helps add to the region's uniqueness. What I like about it because of my interest in wildlife is just the vastness of it. Uh, you, you don't have a lot of people that live in these counties. Uh, so you have big tracts of woodlands and fields. Other parts of the state, lands have been fragmented and uh, the Black Belt still holds some fairly large tracts and uh, it, it makes it unique. We have folks from Mobile and Birmingham and Louisiana and everywhere coming here and purchasing a piece of property because they don't have it there. They don't have a place where they're close to where they can go and, and have a nice lake and, and deer hunt and turkey hunt or quail hunt or do all those kind of things. And so, in a world where natural landscapes are increasingly fragmented by industrialization and urbanization, immense tracts like those found here in the Black Belt are increasingly rare. It could be argued that these vast land holdings in the hands of what are often absentee owners are preserving an important part of Alabama's natural heritage here in the Blackland Prairie. Yet, these patterns of ownership are not so contributive to the local economies. I could easily pass it off by saying we're suffering still from a plantation mentality where the class structure is so thick that they don't cross much. Um, that's probably true. Um, it certainly is true that Alabama will never be as great as it could be unless we pull all of its citizens along. Where the white chalks and dark soils continue to complement each other, there is still a rich and fruitful landscape. Unfortunately, the bounty that can be found in the countryside does not carry over to the lives of many of the people in the Blackland Prairie. 
the unreconciled problem in our state right now isn't just one of race, although we often think of it in racial terms. The unreconciled problem now is what we can do to level off the gaps that exist between people who are winning in our state and people who are losing. The gaps are enormous. You see them in the public education system. It means one thing to get a K-12 education in Sumter County, another thing to get a K-12 education in Shelby County. We have to do something about that. Health care. It means one thing to get sick in Shelby County tonight, another thing to get sick in Wilcox County. If we find ways to close these gaps, we'll help make our state whole, and we will help make Alabama the wonderful community that we can be and that we're struggling to become. How can we bring the fullness of life that nature makes possible into the lives of the people? We can attract industry. We can build new roads. We can impound the rivers. We can grow houses where we used to grow cotton. In short, we can attempt to affect the course of human history in ways that may be disconnected from our natural history. Or perhaps we can take a lesson from the land itself. Maybe we can work together, one with the other, in striving for a future that will be true to the people and the place. People of all races, all walks of life, all ages have got to come together and look collectively at what we need to do uh, for the future of the Black Belt. And I really think that if we're going to change in a positive way the Black Belt, I think we need to be talking with the people who are living there. I think the Black Belt offers us an opportunity in lots of ways where if we have goodwill and good intent, we can make a difference. We can make a small measure of progress and make a huge measure of difference for the people. Here in the Blackland Prairie, nature has shown that contrasts and cooperation can indeed bring forth a world both rich and fruitful.
This program is supported by grants from the Solon and Martha Dixon Foundation, the Alabama Wildlife Federation, working for wildlife since 1935, and the Alabama Department of Conservation and Natural Resources.